The uh, first the first rocks that were gathered on the moon were handled rather gingerly uh, for obvious reasons. But in fact, when a field geologist runs around on the earth, he does a lot of scratching and hammering and certainly dusting off to make sure this is something he really wants to bring back. Uh, are, are you planning to uh, uh, be that active in your selection process, or are you essentially going to look at the way things lie there and, and on that basis alone just pick them up and, and can them up? Well, I, I guess we have sort of a team operation that, that uh, is designed to maybe not do quite that, but we've worked quite extensively with the geologists, and the main idea for our recognition purposes is to ensure in what we're doing up there that we do, in fact, find as many different samples of rocks and document on this documented sample exactly where they came from, both by the near photography and tying back to the LEM so that the geologists can build just the kind of map that you're, you're referring to. They would know whether this was out of uh, a ray from some distant crater, whether it was local to the area, whether it was the 90% coverage or ejector or this sort of thing. And we, we're not going to get up there and try and explain that it's olivine or, or this sort of thing. We, we are going to explain to the geologists uh, with a procedure that we've worked out with them, and Al's going to do it. Uh, we've got this team effort of the most efficient way to document one rock correctly. It requires four photographs and the sampling, and sealed in an individual bag. And the way we work it, I find the rock, I take the cross sun stereo pair, Al takes the picture before the rock is picked up, pick up the rock, put it in the bag, he describes it, and I pick up our equipment and start looking for another rock. When he gets done his description, he puts it in the hand tool carrier, takes one more photograph of the area that we've left. And uh, that's, that's essentially how the documented sample is going to go. And uh, the description that he'll use is, is uh, mainly to tell a geologist things in real time, not about the specific rock, but was it half covered? Uh, why did it attract our attention? This sort of thing. We spent many hours on this to date. I think this is, let me, let me say a little bit about that because this has been one of the things we've spent a lot of training time on is trying to decide what to do with the two and a half hours or whatever there is available on our particular area. There's one school that says you grab the most interesting rock and then you discuss it and a lot of other things, take pictures of it and spend a great deal of time on this particular rock, as describing as best you can. The other field thought is, well, look, you're going to bring this rock back, and you're going to take the four pictures that Pete talked about. So you probably don't want to describe very much of it at all if you're going to be able to see it in person later on when you get it back and get the pictures. So then you might not want to say hardly anything. You want to run around and get as many rocks as you possibly can. So somewhere between these two extremes is what we're going to try to do. And we're going to try to do, as Pete says, bring back as much information as we can in this two and a half hours. And we're going to try to say the things on the air that will warn something that won't be able to view from the pictures or the rock when they get it in hand, namely how it's related to the other rocks, what the percentage this rock is of the total number of rocks that are around on the lunar surface, this sort of thing. The things that they've wondered about, 11 rocks, some of them are, you know, is this an average rock or is this something special for the area? So these are the things we're going to talk about. The second thing we're going to talk about is try to give the ground enough information about the rock or the rocks that we see so that they can aid us in real time, you know, trying to decide what this area might be so we can go to, to some other area. We've, uh, and by thinking this through, and try, we've tried it both ways. We've done it lots and lots of over 200, how many hours is it, Pete? And we've worked geology on this mission. Two, the formal training time is in excess of 250 hours right now. We've got 250 hours just working this problem alone. We've got many more hours of background geology, but just working this problem alone, trying to optimize the amount of return. Uh, we think we've got what we consider the best way to, to, uh, to bring back the maximum amount of information in the time we've got available on the lunar surface right now. Nick, Chris. Uh, Commander Conrad, could you uh, review perhaps once more just briefly how you are going to have greater capability in uh, landing from your previous description uh, and the work of the computer, uh, it would seem as if you were going to have a number of 1201 and 1202 alarms also. Could you just go over that again briefly? Well, the, uh, the 
1201-1202 alarm thing that you're referring to was uh, an interface problem that was never simulated either at the simulations at MIT or at Grumman or did they show up in the uh, LMS simulations here in Houston that occupied some 15% of the computer time uh, during the P63, 4, and 5 programs. Now, this uh, happened to do with reading rendezvous radar CDUs, which I'm sure you don't want to get into, but anyhow, that's been fixed. As far as the software is concerned, that, that particular problem has been fixed. And as we usually do in NASA, we've overkilled the problem, so we're pulling a couple extra circuit breakers and leaving some other switches in some places, even though the computer program has been fixed, absolutely super guaranteed that that won't happen. <laughs> and uh, so we probably won't see any 1201s or 1202s, but they got a lot of other alarms in there that, that nobody's seen yet. So. Hey, yeah. I'd like, let, me, let me say one thing about this. Uh, the name of the game we're in right now is, is exploration and, and trying new things. And, what happened on 11 with the computer alarm to a lot of people, they said, well, you didn't design the computer right, uh, you didn't <laughs> look at it closely enough to see that you might get alarms and that sort of thing. But I think most of us look at that whole affair there just a little bit differently. And I, on any flight we've ever had, because we're doing new things all the time, we end up finding out things we, we didn't think about beforehand or didn't know about beforehand. And the beauty of the, the thing that occurred on 11 is to me that right in the most critical part of the whole mission, the people on the ground in Mission Control Center when this came up and the people in the air were able to solve a problem that nobody had foreseen beforehand and make the landing. Now, it's my expectation that we're going to have something on our flight, two or three things, we've had them on every flight, where nobody's thought of it before. It's never happened before. We've never even considered it. It's going to come up. And the thing that makes us all feel good about this thing is we've got a team together here, both in flight and on the ground, it can solve these problems as they come out no matter what phase they're in. So I don't think that the 1201-1202 uh, alarms are as, they're a bad situation, but I think the beauty of the whole thing is the fact that we were able to do it real time, solve the problem, make the landing. And I, I uh, hope we don't have anything that bad, but if we do, I hope we can handle it as well as they did. What Al's telling you, you're going to be disappointed if we don't get a surprise. So I'm sure I will be too. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, the other thing, you want to know what it is in the computer program, we've done to update the, the thing. If you're familiar with the term RLS, which is the vectors that they put in for the landing site, there's a term buried in the computer program called Delta Land. And in the LPD mode, when the stick does not control the spacecraft, but it's used to put signals to the computer to tell it to redesignate the landing site. If you look out, see, we have two ways of doing that. We can do it through the computer. I can look through the angle measuring device on the windshield, and the computer is telling me through that device what angle I have to look to see the landing site. Now, if that's not where I want to land, that's how I decide where the computer is telling me that it's going to land me. Now, if I automatically want to change that, I can put stick inputs in, pitch then becomes downrange, pitch up then becomes uprange and what it does specifically is it redesignates the landing site a half a degree at whatever altitude I'm at at that time so that's a variable number in feet it designates it either a half a degree short or a half a degree long per click of the stick now when I go left or right it will redesignate left or right of the landing site two degrees which again is a variable distance depending on your height and the thumb rule is for downrange, for instance, if I'm 7,000 feet in the air and I redesignate one click, I'm going to get 10% of my altitude in feet. So I'm going to redesignate 700 feet past where it's telling me I'm going right now. Okay. Now, this computer input from the stick is called Delta Land. All they've done to our computer program is given us the ability to dial up those addresses with a new noun and load delta land rather than with the stick inputs, but with a decimal number. Now, the reason we did that is because of the Lear processor, the ground will see these down track errors come up. What the ground has done is they've initialized our state vectors at PDI if they're absolutely perfect for the landing site. And when we come up to PDI and light the engine and the Lear processor comes up, it is accurate enough to show them what the errors are from that perfect state vector. And they have a way of processing that data right now rapidly and converting it in 
to a downrange distance in feet that were going to be 2,000 feet long, 3,000 feet short, something like that. At two minutes into power descent, the Capcom is going to call up that number. And it may be zero. If we've really done our homework, it could be zero. You know. And it, well, let me say it could be zero because we won't put anything in unless it's greater than 2,000 feet because that's still in the noise level of the errors right now. I should mention the errors. I, we don't expect under the best conditions that we've done right now to be any better than plus or minus a half a mile to start with 3,000 feet, half a nautical mile. So we're not even going to input anything into the computer unless it's greater than 2,000 feet. And if we're so far off that it's greater than 20,000 feet, forget the surveyor because something else is wrong and we'll go land wherever we can find a place to park it. It obviously won't be near the surveyor. So uh, to change the computer program is to be able to dial up this delta land and input into it downrange errors in thousands of feet, or hundreds of feet, I should say. We're going to round off the numbers. They'll pass us a number like plus 1,400. That means we're going to go 1,400 feet long because of errors. It's still trying to get us to the right place. Okay? Okay, Carl Abraham. Uh, have you, uh, <clears throat> your, your, your uh, flight plan really is devoid of extracurricular activities such as ceremonies and... Uh, and such as what? <laughs> ceremonies and, uh, and other uh, observances as we've been led to believe. Uh, are you really planning to just go up there and put in an eight-hour day and... Uh, sorry, not <laughs> put in a 32-hour day and uh, come home again uh, and not leave any mementos behind or anything else? To my knowledge, at this point, <laughs> we have no ceremonies that I know about plan other than there is a plaque mounted on the landing gear. It's the same size as the one that was on Apollo 11 that simply says Apollo 12 landed here in November of 1969 and it has our three signatures on it and that's it. And we don't even plan to unveil it. It's right out there in the open to start with. <laughs> and the American flag is, as always, been painted on the side of the descent stage. You'll know it's from this country. <laughs> Lee Holly. That was what I was going to ask also. You don't plan to take any discs, or do you, do you plan to take any type of uh, commemorative uh, souvenirs to bring back to give to heads of state and this kind of thing? Nothing? Uh, not outside, no. I we think we'll have some of the normal things that have always been carried, but nothing special. I have no plans. Well, if you go on a world tour when you get back, for example, what will you give these people from the moon? Well, I don't know. Back in the old days, somebody used to buy those medals for us who will remain nameless, and we now are no longer associated with them, so we buy our own, and at six bucks or nine bucks a piece, we can't afford to buy too many. And uh, <laughs> so these, these are, are uh, they are personal things. They've been carried on every spacecraft, but... Uh, uh, Anybody in the office, who's in our office, that wants those, puts in their nine bucks, and they get one back when we get back, and that's the way it's been for quite a while. And these are, uh, other than you want to give them to somebody, there's no plans, I'll put it that way. <laughs>